Chapter four. Late that night, we heard sleds on the road far off to the south. They came closer, past our house, and we ran after them. The hunters carried my father into the store. He was stretched out on one of the kayaks. He, they put him down by the fire and covered him with a rope. He said nothing. He's doing pretty good, Anvo Norvik said, but he's got a bad hand. It's frozen, turning black. He needs a doctor. There was a heavy silence while Anvo Norvik went into his office and started up his radio. Crackling sounds and sputtering voices were all that we heard for what seemed like an hour. It could have been half an hour. I stood beside my father. He was under a mound of fur robes and I couldn't see any part of him. I spoke to him and he said a few words that I didn't understand. They sounded as though they came out of the deep hole. Anvo Norvik said, I got Doc Evans. He's over in Grassy Creek working on broken legs. He'll be here in six hours or less, depending on the weather. John Evans was the only doctor between Wamengo and Nome. He traveled around making regular calls at fishing villages along the Sound. Dr. Evans had saved many lives. Driving his team of six Malamutes, he reached the store at gray dawn and operated on my father. He had to take off all of the fingers on Bartok's right hand, all except his thumb. Your husband is a strong man, Dr. Evans said to my mother as he left to go up to the sound of Ovakov. The worst is over. We took my father home, but the worst was not over. His hand healed, but there was something strange about him. About two weeks later, I was sitting by the window working on a sealskin boots I sold to people in Nome who sold them to visitors in the summer. Our house was on the shore and the window faced westward to the sea. My father glanced out and jum jumbled spires of the Ewanooks. With a groan, he yanked the curtain shut, plunged the room into darkness. I got up and lit a lamp. As I walked back to the table where I was working, the light shone on my father's face. His eyes were two deep hollows. His mouth was twisted to one side. His bronze skin was pale underneath. For a moment, I thought he was looking at a ghost. That day, he ate a little of his food that we cooked for him. That night, I heard him talking in his sleep. I could not make out what he was saying, though. It was loud, so fearsome that the sled dogs on the porch stopped their stirring. They did not raise their voices again that night. My father was the chief man of our village. He was called Anyukak, the one who everyone listens to. Everyone did listen to him. But two days later, on the morning of the elders meet, met to talk about problems, he did not appear. They thought that he had forgotten to come, so they sent a messenger to our home to remind him. When the messenger knocked on our door, my father did not answer. He sent me, saying, tell them that Bartok has a fever in his head. He was silent. He sat all day with his back to the window and stared and said nothing. Whenever the big ice flows drifted down from the north and crashed on shore, making thunderous sounds, he would tremble and turn pale. Early in February, February, the elders decided that the village should have a new Anyayukak. My father hadn't been to the meetings for a long while. They chose a new man whom everyone listened to, but said nothing to Bartok about it. Then Dr. Evans came on one of the visits to our village. He was surprised at what he told him, how my father had quit going to the council meetings and he never left the house. 
that he kept the windows closed and sat with his back to it. Now he trembled whenever sounds drifted in from the frozen sea. Dr. Evans motioned for mother and me to go outside. It was a warm day and he stood in the yard with the hook of his parka thrown back. He was tall and broad shoulders and towered over us. In the doctor's voice, he said, I have seen dozens of cases like this before. Hunters who were caught on floating ice and drifting for days, for a week, not knowing what hour they would freeze to death, afraid to sleep for fear that they will not wake up, Others who fell into the sea by accident, who would have died in minutes from the cold if they had not been rescued. Not one of these men ever hunted again. It's a phobia. The sled dogs were barking, eager to be back on the trail. Suddenly, they were silent. Bartok had come out to the shed and was listening to us. My mother had never heard the word phobia before. I could tell that it startled her. I had heard it used in school about m mad animals, but it startled me too. Fear, Dr. Evans said, it's powerful. My husband has hunted since he was a boy, my mother said. He is not a fearful man. Deep down, all hunters are fearful, the doctor said, but your husband is fearful now, every minute of his life. What will happen? What can we do? My mother said. Hard as it may be, it's best that you leave the village and go where the man cannot hear or look at the sea or even smell it. I know of a place, Ikuma, it is on the big river where fishing and hunting are good. Ikuma has a good school, a better school than here. I am going there next week. I will find you a place to live. My father came out to the shed, huddled up in his parka, and turned away from the sea, blinking in the wan light, smiling a wan smile. Three days later, we moved to Ikuma, 40 miles from the sea coast. We hadn't much to move. The pot, bellied stove, cooking pans, dishes, knives, and forks, a barrel of smoked salmon, a barrel of seal meat, and six caribou skin we slept on. We piled everything in a big sled and Bartok drove. He stood straight on the runners. He looked almost the way he did before those days on the floating ice. The dogs were eager to go. Mary Kay and I got on the sled and covered ourselves with one of the caribou skins. My father cracked his whip. It curled around the dog's ears. When we came to the hill that looked down on our village, my mother's glance back. Bartok was born in Wamengo, she said quietly, and his mother and father were born in Wamengo. Their mothers and fathers were born there. It is sad that we will not see our village ever again. You will like the new place, I said, though I felt sad too, and I had no idea what the new place would be like. My father cracked his long whip again. He shouted at the dogs and did not look back at the village or the frozen sea. Chapter five. Ikuma was not a village like Wamengo. It had more than a thousand people, a post office, two cafes and three stores besides a trading post. At first, we lived on the far side of the river at the edge of the tundra, a great treeless place. Our makeshift house was made of birch bent over and tied at the top and covered with caribou skins. After a year, after my father got well and found work with the Empire Canoeing Company, Cannon Company, we moved to a house in town and I had my own room the first one I had ever had. The school was much bigger than the school in Wamengo. There were three teachers. Helen Gramas taught English and history, such as the Constitution and the Revolutionary War. Ellen Dusick taught arithmetic, 
John Seward taught geography and other things. There was also a church where the Reverend Cartwright told us about God and the devil, about heaven and hellfire. I got mixed up listening to him because I had always believed in God, Sila. Sila is a mystery. He lives far apart from us, way off in the nothingness. No one was, had ever seen him. No one had ever heard him. But he watched to see what we do, not harm the world that we live in. The air, the water, our friends, the animals, the land, and the sky. If we do harm them, he will become angry, and all of us will vanish from the earth like mist in the morning. John Seward encouraged us to play games. He led the school band and taught me to play the trumpet. Dog sledding was a very popular sport. The school had two sleds, three dogs to the sled, and he taught us how to race. He could do everything. The Yukon is a wonderful river for sleds. It's wind back and forth like a mammoth snake. And in places, it is more than a mile wide. When the ice is covered with a light snow and the dogs can get their footing, the sleds fly. I was the only student in school who owned a dog team, but in the town there were dozens and most of them raced on Saturdays. Usually the races were 30 miles long. The prizes were merchandise from the stores and meals at the two cafes. I never won, but I did finish every race and came in second twice. I won a dinner at the Blue Goose Cafe and once a glass of cooking, a glass cooking dish. My father didn't like his job at the Empire Canning Company. They canned salmon in the spring, but this was deep winter. The big tin building was deserted. All Bartek had to do was to be watchman for three hours, six days a week and look out for power prowlers. It was a lonely job, walking around empty tables and silent machinery. When he got home, he never had much to say. Why don't you go out like Bright Dawn does and race the dogs? Mother asked him one night. My father frowned. Dogs are meant for work, not for racing. They are trained to do both, I said. He gave the supper table a blow with his big fists. They set the dishes to rattling. For work, not for play, he said. But we kept at him. Every night at supper, we brought up the dog sled racing. It took us most of the winter to get him on a sled. We were not surprised that he came in third in his first race and won a pair of beaded mule skins. In the next race, he came in first and won a new parka. After that, he was on the river every Saturday, and I didn't have a chance to race until spring. He was very short and had a bow in a bow in both legs, but he was strong. In the bad place, he jumped off the sled and pushed and kept pushing for an hour. Even with his bad hands, he grasped the caribou whip with only his thumb and sent it slinging along the backs of our seven dog sled dogs. He won six races, then the big one, the 300 mile race and $500. Akuma had a check station on the Iditarod, the famous dog sled race that starts in Anchorage on the Gulf of Alaska, crosses rivers, vast stretches of frozen tundra, two great mountain ranges, and ends in Nome on the Bering Sea after 1,179 perilous miles. At Ikuma, drivers check in and out. Their times are kept in the book and sent by radio from the checkpoint to the next. In that way, it is known 
which drivers are first and which are last and which are in between. The Iditarod was a big event in Akuma, the biggest of the whole year. People talked about it months before it happened. I played a horn in the school band. Two weeks before the racers came through town, we practiced on Yukon Street and marched up and down and got ready to greet them. The mushers came on the 19th of March. It had taken them more than 13 days to travel from Anchorage to Ikuma. They still had to travel 107 miles to reach Nome. The night before they came, and even the night before that, I couldn't sleep. I had heard about the Iditarod for years. In Wamengo, people talked about it, but I never thought that I could stand in a crowd somewhere and watch the race. I had never dreamed in my wildest dreams that somebody I <clears throat> that somebody I would march someday I would march in the band playing my silver horn wearing a spring parka trimmed with wolverine fur and welcome racers of the famous Iditarod it snowed hard all day on the 19th of March but everyone in Ikuma was waiting on Yukon Street when our school band gathered in front of the Gem Cafe and welcomed the first drivers with God Bless America and America the Beautiful. 71 mushers had started from Anchorage, we heard, but only 35 arrived in Akuma. The rest had dropped out. They checked in one after another for three days. On the third night, the last driver that appeared was a girl. She staggered when she got off her sled. She looked so cold and bedraggled that I invited her to come home with me. She smiled weakly. My name is Deborah Reed. She was about 19, a year or two older than I am, and I came from Penabasak in Maine. My mother cooked a hearty meal for her, but she didn't eat it. All she wanted to do was sleep. For how long? I asked her. Forever, she said. There's hot water. Do you want a bath? Sleep, she said. Are you going to give up? She thought for a moment, then shook her head. When do you want to leave? Wake me in five hours, please. She fell asleep in a chair. She was frostbite on her cheeks. I went outside and fed her dogs. I kept track of the time and got her up in five hours. She ate two bowls of soup and I made her some moose sandwiches. I've run in some races, I told her, but they were nothing like the Iditarod, of course. Tell me about the Iditarod. You bounce along on a rough trail, she said, sometimes on no trail at all. A wind, wild wind blows in your face and the temperature is 40 below. With the wind, it could be 100 below. You freeze and think that you're going to die and wish that you would. You sleep four hours a day. You wake up and make a fire and feed a dozen dogs. You examine their feet and legs and boots. You harness them to a tow line. It snows, the snow turns into a blizzard. Comes another day, it's the same, but different. You climb a steep hill, too steep for the dogs, so you get off the sled and push. The dogs want to lie down. You urge them on. Over the hill and trail plunges down, back and forth. You stand on the brake. You put out your snow anchor, but the sled races on while you grit your teeth. Then there's another day, the same, but not the same. Her face was pale under the skin that the cold had blackened. The sun came up and she got on her sled. The dogs lunged against their harness. I watched her disappear in the falling snow. With all my heart, despite what she had told me, I wished I was on the sled racing to Nome. Then something strange happened. That night while we were eating supper, Bill Wise, president of the Empire Cannon Company and Frank Gibson, owner of the Gem Cafe, Cafe, appeared. Every year, Mr. Wise said to us, we enter a driver in the Iditarod. We have entered six drivers, but none of them have won. 
Mr. Gibson said, in fact, none of them have ever finished the race. It's not very good for Akuma. Gives Akuma a bad name. Mr. Wise said to my father, we've heard about the races you've been winning around here. Quite a record you've established, Mr. Gibson said. We've been wondering if you could enter, if we could enter you in next year's Iditarod, Mr. Wise said suddenly. My father was startled. The, Mr. Gibson said, the first prize is $50,000. There are other prizes too, 150,000 in prizes. My father was silent. Money did not mean anything to him. He thought of the white man was crazy, talking money all the time. If my father could gather warm parkas for his family, boots that kept the water out, dry food for the stove, dry wood for the stove, enough seal and fish to last the winter, then he was happy and made that made us happy. Mr. Wise seemed to know this. He was half Eskimo and half Tlingit Indian. It was the Tlingit part that had made him rich. It it's not the money so much, he said. It's the test. It's the Iditarod. A man finds out who he is and what he is. It's a test of bravery. My father rubbed his bad hand against his chin and sudden glint in his eye. Then Frank Gibson said that they would pay for everything, supplies, food, for the driver, food, for the dogs, food drops at the checkpoints, everything, a dog team if necessary. It takes a year to train for the Iditarod, Mr. Wise said. You'll be on the payroll of the Empire Canning Company, the same as always, but you'll spend 10 hours a day on the trail, getting your team in shape. My father was dumbfounded. He stared at the two men. Mr. Wise said, you should start training tomorrow. My fa father sat and stared. Chapter six. Early the next morning, the sled drove up in front of our house. A man with a gray beard got off the runner. He came to the door and spoke to my father. My name is Peter Avkoff, he said. I've been hired to help get you ready for the Iditarod. I've raced it in two of them, came in fifth and tenth, raced in the last one too, but my heart acted up and I had to drop out. My father was still recovering from the shock. Mr. Wise and Mr. Gibson had dealt him the night before. Are you ready? Peter Avkov said. <coughs> My father didn't answer. He was out the door, dragging me along. Together, we harnessed up our dogs. I need weight, he said. What do you weigh, Bright Dawn? 129 pounds, I said. Jump in, my father said. He sent the caribou wick snaking along the dog's back, and we went off for the river, Peter Avcock and the team running beside us. We ran 20 slow miles down the river, then stopped for P Peter Avcock to rest and talk about the Iditarod, how it was different from all the other dog sled races. When we got back, he came into the house and talked again. My father, who had never learned to write, asked me to put down every word for word as Peter Avcock talked how to pass another team on the trail and keep the dogs from fighting the other teams, how often to feed the dogs, how much, how all they could eat, and what food was best. Water was very important, how often they should drink and how much, surely not all that they could. My father had seven dogs on his team. You need a twice that number, Peter Avcock said. You'll lose dogs along the way, virus and accident. You have to finish the race with seven at least. It took only nine, only a day for Mr. Wise to find more good dogs, trained dogs that had raced before. After that, the two men went out every day and four times a week at night. 
because a lot of the Iditarod was run at night. I went with them on Saturdays. I took down what Peter Avcock said. By summer, I had a small book of notes. Every week on my Every week, my father asked me to read them over to him from the beginning. When the ice on the big river broke up, he and Peter Avcock took their teams into the hills north of the village, where deep snow still lay on the ground. They trained all summer, though most of the snow had melted by July, going out days and nights and traveling at least 50 miles each time. After most of the snow had melted, there were stretches of mud holes and quivering ground that shook and bounced the sled. It wasn't much fun, but Peter Avcock told my father that he would encounter lots of mud holes in the Iditarod, and it was a good idea to get used to them. In November, John Stewart put the two dog sleds from the school together borrowed another team from the trading post and entered me and my friend Julie Englet in the 300 mile Ikuma Nome Express race. We were out for four days and had had fun, but came in 21st and 22nd. It was the next month after a heavy snow had fallen and my father and I had the terrible accident. Early one Sunday, we were out on the trail. My father tried to pass Peter Avcock's team. Our sled was bouncing and I was holding on tight with both hands. We were halfway past the other team. Our dogs were barking at his dogs. Bartok snaked out the long caribou wick. Now we were past them. We were about to swing back onto the trail and Peter Avcock shouted, Good! The dogs were kicking snow in our face. Suddenly, our sled skipped to one side of the trail, then to the other, but it didn't straighten out. It rose in the air and came down, rose again, tipped, skated along on one runner and crashed against a tree. My father was on his feet before I got to him. He, <clears throat> We were both dazed and covered with snow. Peter Avcock untangled our dogs. We got the sled right side up and headed back home. Bartok made a joke about the accident, but he looked so pale that I knew he was injured. Ikuma did not have a doctor. We had a good veterinarian though. Dr. Gasha looked at Bartok and took x-rays and that said that his left shoulder was cracked in two places. He wound it up with yarn and tape, made a sling, and gave Bartok some medicine, which he didn't take. Mr. Wise and Mr. Gibson came while we were eating. They had heard about the accident and talked to the veterinarian. My father jumped up from the table and made a show of being in fine shape. Three weeks and I'll be back, he shouted. Mr. Wise gave him a sharp look. That's not what we heard. The vet says that you'll be laid up for six weeks, maybe even longer. Dr. Gibson said, that's too bad, terrible, Mr. Wise said. Both men were sympathetic, but I felt that already they had made up their mind that Bartok would not get well in time for the race. Three weeks and I'll be back, my father said, still shouting, swinging an arm and to show them how strong he was. Say, you are back in three weeks, Mr. Gibson said. That will be the middle of January. The race starts early March. Your team needs to run 50 miles a day to get in shape. That's more than a thousand miles gone, lost, down the drain. Bright Dawn will train the dogs for me, my father said. She's a good trainer. But what if your shoulder doesn't heal in three weeks, Mr. Wise asked. What if it takes six weeks, two months, the vet says. What happens then? My father didn't answer. Well, I will tell you what happens, Mr. Wise went on. We've spent more than $20,000 on fees, food for you, food for the dogs, 
food drops here in Ikuma and other checkpoints on the best sled money can buy on seven trained Malamutes that alone cost us $4,200. We spent all this money and there we would be on the day of the race starts with no one to race. Do you get the point? My father sat down at the table. Then we got up and strode across the room and looked out the window at the falling snow. Then he came back and sat down again. He did not answer. Mr. Wise in a lamplight cheeks had a glossy glow, but his hands clenched in a knot were white. He glanced at me, started to say something and stopped. For a long while, there was no sound in the room except the cracking of wood in the big stove. Then Mr. Wise said, these are the facts to Bartok. What do you think we should do? Wait and see what happens? Gamble that you'll get well in the month or six weeks? What? It seemed terribly hard for my father to answer. Words came out of his mouth slowly. My daughter will run the race, he said. Mr. Wise and Mr. Gibson were startled. They looked at each other, then at me. Mr. Wise said, but your daughter's too young. She's still in school. A schoolgirl, Mr. Gibson said. I could say nothing. I was overwhelmed by the thought of racing in the Iditarod. Then I got all of my wits together in a hurry. I am not a schoolgirl, I said. I graduated from school the 10th of this month. I have a diploma. There it is on the wall. I pointed. The men turned and glanced at the diploma. And I am not a girl. I am 18 years old. I am a woman. Women who have won the Iditarod. Two of them, my father said. They weren't much older than my daughter. I know, I know, Mr. Wise said. Mr. Gibson said nothing, then pulled his parkas. As they left, Mr. Wise said, you will hear from us soon. It was not soon. A day went by, almost two went by. I gave up hope on the second day, but my father told me that he had had a vision. They will come tonight, he said. They have decided you will run in the big race. Will I win? Will I win? He thought, the vision is not clear about the winning part. Mr. Wise and Mr. Gibson came while we were eating supper. They took off their parkas. They stood by the stove and warmed their hands and said nothing. I poured two mugs of coffee for them. They didn't thank me. They just stood there getting warm. What news do you bring? My father said to the men impatient with them. My mother stood silent by the stove. Her hands were clasped together. From the first, she hadn't liked the idea of my running in the dangerous Iditarod. Though she said had said nothing, she never went against my father. What? he asked, raising his voice. Good news, Mr. Gibson said. Very good news, Mr. Wise said. I've talked to the people in Anchorage. I've given them the facts that the, about the race. Your daughter has run her age and so forth. She is entered in the Iditarod and tomorrow you start training. Mr. Gibson added, tonight, I said. Before they left, I got out the notes that I had taken down from Peter Avcock and read them over. The next morning, as the moon set on the river with Peter Avcock and the 14 dogs, he sat in the sled and I drove. I had never driven more than seven dogs. The 14 dogs seemed to stretch out in front of me for miles. I would need to learn how to control that many dogs. It was done only by voice command, not by reins. Go, whoa, gee, for a right turn, ha, for a left turn, come gee, come ha, for a complete turn, depending on whether the turn was right or left, and shouted so the leader heard. Today we go five hours, Peter Avcock said. We go slow. We come back slow. Tomorrow the same. In a week we will choose and see who goes where in the line. I knew half the dogs already. They were friends. 
the two wheel dogs, the dogs that ran side by side directly in front of the sled, were named Thunder and Lightning. Thunder was male Malamute, gray with a black overcoat. Lightning, a female, looked much like him. They were brothers and sister and ran well together. The next four dogs in the line were from a different litter, but all had been bred by the Malamute Eskimo tribe who lived near the mouth of the Yukon River. They were named Sun, Moon, Sky, and Blizzard. The first three were brown-eyed, tawny-colored dogs. Sun and Moon, gray Alaskan Huskies, were tireless. Sky, who had some Malamute and some Husky blood in her, was dependable, silver-coated with an amber musk, Blizzard was different from the other six dogs. He never ran faster than he had to, but in a pinch he could fly. He was my father's favorite. He had used him as a leader and liked him better than Black Star. Black Star, as I have said before, was my favorite. This morning I put him in the lead. With his tail furled and his ears alcent, he seemed to enjoy being out in front of the 13 dogs, seven of them strangers who would soon lord it over. Peter Avcock and I raced 10 hours a day for a week, and on the 12th and on the 25th of February, I boarded the brush plane Mr. Wise had hired to take me and my team to Anchorage. It was a holiday in Ikuma. The town came to the landing strip, the school band played, and Mr. Wise gave a short speech. Bright dawn, you will bring great honor to Ikuma. We sent you away with the hearts bursting with pride. We await the day when you will return to us on your way to victory. Victory? I was glad that he had nothing more to say about victory or about Bright Dawn, who was trembling in her mule skins.